Well, hello, friends. Welcome back. So, today in Ethics and Medicine, we are going to be looking at uh, the right to refuse treatment and how it relates to informed consent, uh, decision making capacity, and end of life choices, including advanced directives and uh, power of attorney. I don't know if we're going to get this into one video or two, but let's just get started. So, as you recall from Miss Chen, remember Miss Chen, the anxiety prone uh, patient? It is generally accepted that informed consent should be obtained from all patients with decision making capacity undergoing any procedure more invasive than, for example, a lab draw or basic physical exam, provided that the situation is not so urgent that doing so would delay emergency treatment and cause harm. Patients show evidence of decision-making capacity by A, being able to understand medical problems, proposed treatments, alternatives, options to refuse treatment, and foreseeable consequences of accepting or refusing proposed treatments, and B, being able to express a rational, internally consistent preference. And Now, we're going to go through the informed consent, right, and you'll see there's probably a reason why I taught autonomy to us as I did, and I used the three components that I did, and I, we talked about constraints the way we did, because it just seems a little bit easier. You can see how all of that's encompassed in this, but it's just a little uh, jargony. Decision-making capacity is different than competency, which is usually determined in a binary fashion, being competent or not being competent in a given situation. No, actually, not true. Competency is an overarching thing. Capacity is in individual situations. Anyway, the informed consent discussion should include four components. The facts of the patient's situation or condition, the potential treatment options, including no treatment, the risks and benefits of proposed treatments and non-treatment options, and the physician's recommended course of action. The quantity and specificity of the information should be tailored to the preferences, needs, and understanding of the patient. Patients may refuse part or all of the information provided or may designate another person to participate in the care discussion on their behalf. Although it is exceedingly controversial, some argue that, under very special circumstances, the physician may invoke therapeutic privilege and withhold information regarding a diagnosis or treatment if disclosing it would pose a serious threat to the patient. The rationale is that in such cases, the principles of beneficence, right? The physician should act in the best interests of the patient, and non-maleficence, the physician should not harm the patient, supersede the principle of respect for patient autonomy. So if you remember this court, this uh, case study, they were like making the justification for, should we not tell Ms. Chen all of the possible complications that could result from going under amnesia, uh, if doing so is going to exacerbate her anxiety and cause her harm, right? Um, and so here you see classic therapeutic privilege invoked. And so today I want us to take a little time and apply this in a situation of whether or not the patient has the right to refuse treatment, right? We saw way back in the beginning, uh, the woman come in with a aneurysm and she doesn't want surgery and they perform the aneur the surgery to save her life against her will. Uh, and whether, and she sued them for millions is, uh, you know, Presumably, she had uh, informed consent. She had decision-making capacity. She knew the risks, the alternatives, and was willing to risk it. Uh, and so today, I had us read uh, the court case for Mary Northern, or like the 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 expert, uh, which in class normally I have us literally act it out in individuals, play the parts. And what I kind of want to do is uh, see whether we thought she had expressed herself and demonstrated informed consent and decision-making capacity, or whether we, should, we thought that she was, in fact, psychotic, as the court uh, ruled. So reading from page 311, well is illustrated in the case of Mary Northern, a stubborn 72-year-old woman suffering from gangrene of both feet. Although Miss Northern's physicians insisted that surgical amputation of her feet was required to save her life, she adamantly refused to grant them permission to operate. Contrary to the opinion of her physicians, she maintained that her feet were improving and that surgery was thus unnecessary. While her physicians characterized her refusal as irrational, 
a court-appointed guardian remarked on her good memory and overall coherence and intelligence. Her physicians found her to be psychotic with regard to the discussions about her feet, but her guardian concluded she was of sound mind. Mary Northern's own testimony, delivered from her bed in an intensive care unit, supports both conclusions. Who was right? More important, what do we mean by competency and what standards of decision-making capacity should be imposed on patients like Mary Northern? That Mary Northern was 72 years old, with no available help from relatives, that Mary Northern resided alone under unsatisfactory conditions, as a result of which she had been admitted to and was a patient in Nashville General Hospital. That the patient suffered from gangrene of both feet, which required the removal of her feet to save her life. The patient lacked the capacity to appreciate her condition or to consent to necessary surgery. <coughs> Court of Appeals of Tennessee, 1978. Attached are two identical letters from doctors. Miss Mary Northern is a patient under our care. She has gangrene of both feet, probably secondary to frostbite and then thermal burning of the feet. She has developed infection along with the gangrene of her feet. This is placing her life in danger. A brief saunter through wet gangrene. Some pretty ugly stuff. Might as well use this technology if we're gonna, huh? Well, <clears throat> she has developed infection along with the gangrene of her feet. This is placing her life in danger. This is what I want you to pay attention to. Miss Northern does not understand the severity or consequences of her disease process and does not appear to understand that failure to amputate the feet at this time will probably result in her death. It's our recommendation as the physicians in charge of, this of her case that she undergo amputation of both feet as soon as possible, whether she wants to or not. And so what I want you to really decide when you read that case is, is she demonstrating awareness of the severity of the situation, of what happens if she chooses to not amputate, what her life expectancy is, right? Is she aware of the alternatives? Does she demonstrate the ability to compare those alternatives with her own long-term goals and values? I would really urge you to do this. It's much more interesting if we do this in class, but c'est la vie, here we are. So, so on page 327, this is what the court finally decided. I'm assuming you've read the like excerpt of the different judges talking with her. The physicians have determined, and the chancellor and this court have agreed, that Miss Northern's life is critically in danger, that she's mentally incapable of comprehending the facts which constitute that danger, and that she is, to the extent, incap incompetent, thereby, just thereby justifying state action to preserve her life. As will be observed from the Bill of Exceptions, a member of this court asked Miss Northern if she would prefer to die rather than lose her feet, and her answer was probably. This is the most definitive expression of her desires in this record. The patient has not expressed a desire to die. She expressed ev evidences a strong desire to live and an equally strong desire to keep her dead feet. She refuses to make a choice. If the patient would assume and exercise her rightful command control over her own destiny by stating that she prefers death to the loss of her feet, her wish would be respected. The doctor so testified, this court so informed her, and this court now reiterates its commitment to this principle. So this is what I really want you to figure out if she did not express an understanding of her choice. Because going to the section, I mean, on the bottom of 331, she says, I don't want to discuss it anymore. I made my point, right? And I would ask you, having read this, did she make her point? What was her point? She said, well, they're not gonna, they're not gonna take away my legs. They are not going to take my legs away from me. You understand? She's like, no. And what do they say? Does she not understand that if she keeps her legs, she might die? If your feet, the flesh of your feet really is dead, and if you have a one chance in 10 of living without surgery, that is, if the feet are left on, that nine chances to one, you will not live. It will kill you. I am not going to have, again, Judge Todd cuts her off. Would you still say, I want that one chance? Well, of course, ma'am. I mean, there they're like, do you understand one in 10 chance, nine out of 10, you're going to die? She's like, you're not going to do it. 
I get it. You're not going to do it. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, is she making her point clear? Does she recognize the dangers of doing this? This woman's 72. She was she lived on her own. I mean, you got to understand, this woman was like first, second wave feminist movement. I mean, she like rose up in the 60s. I think she was even a columnist for a magazine. I mean, she lived her own way. You're going to tell me at 72, you're going to strap this woman down to a bed, sedate her, and cut off both of her feet for her own good? You know how traumatizing that would be? Are you kidding me? You don't even... Mm -hmm. Come on now. Now, this court case deemed her incompetent and like... However, luckily, she died before they could do the surgery. Imagine how traumatic. You're ready in the twilight of your years. And if you really, I mean, the other really interesting question, which hopefully I'll write it up in the like discussion board, how, how was the bedside manner of these doctors and these judges, I should say? Judge Todd and Judge uh, Droda, what's his name? Like, did they show empathy for her? Did they come in with their minds already made up? Or were they, like, really trying to suss out the, you know, what where she was, what her actual competency and, you know, decision-making capacity was? Because however you feel, like, I mean, I would urge you to count the number of times they interrupted her. Just go through it and count the number of times they interrupted It was more than twice, okay? Okay? Um. So here's their conclusion on 326. Nevertheless, I believe she is functioning on a psychotic level with respect to ideas concerning her gangrenous feet. She tends to believe that her feet are black because of soot or dirt. She does not believe her physicians about the serious infection. There is an adamant belief that her feet will heal without surgery, and she refused to even consider the possibility that amputation is necessary to save her life. She does has no desire to die, yet her judgment concerning recovery is markedly impaired. If she appreciated the seriousness of her condition, heard her physician's opinions, and concluded against an operation, then I would believe she understood and could decide for herself. But my impression is that she does not appreciate the dangers to her life. I conclude that she is incompetent to decide this manner. A corollary to this denial is seen in her unwillingness to consider any future plans. Here again, I believe she is utilizing a psychotic mechanism of denial. So they're trying to say that she was, because she declined, didn't want to talk about it, didn't want them to look at her legs, tried to change the subject, started, you know, they're clearly just, I really wish we could do this thing in person. And you could see how she like very directly tries to be polite, you know, and then when they're just not listening to her, she just starts to, well, you know, you guys look, it's so nice of you guys to come and visit a lady today. Is it Groundhog Day? How are you? Right? You know, like, just, I imagine my mom, my grandmother on the, on the East Coast, old wasp culture. And here the physicians are saying, if she only appreciated, I mean, I just read to you. She's like, yeah, one out of 10 chance, give it to me. You're not cutting my feet off. I've lived on my own. I'll die on my own. They're fine. Let me be I'm not asking you for anything. And they're like, if only she had expressed herself clearly, if only she'd made her point as she thought she had. And so, if, as repeatedly stated, this patient could and would give evidence of a comprehension of the facts of her condition and could and would express her unequivocal, unequivocal desire in the face of such comprehended facts, then her decision, however unreasonable to others, would be accepted and honored by the courts and by her doctors difficulties that she cannot or will not comprehend the facts. And so I'll be fascinated to know whether you guys think she was in her mind, right mind to be able to refuse treatment. See you soon.